Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, Yvonne, you can get started if you want. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, hello, everyone, and um, thanks uh, for coming to uh, today's um, webinar, TechX webinar. Uh, and before we get into today's very exciting talk um, by Nadia, I just wanted to take the first five minutes quickly to introduce uh, to you all the single cell product that Nadia has used to generate her very exciting data. And that's our single cell immune uh, profiling kit. But some of you might simply know this as the five prime kit. So the goal of the next few slides is just to highlight what analytes can be measured with the single cell resolution uh, at single cell resolution using this kit, um, ultimately to show you how you can use this uh, multi, multi omic approach, um, studying your key immunology questions. And before uh, we dive straight into the capabilities of the immune profiling assay, let's just take a couple of steps back and look at the actual Chromium single cell platform as a whole. And what you can see here is the Chromium instrument or the Chromium platform uh, consisting of this small instrument, the Chromium controller, uh, which is fairly small, like a size of a shoebox. We also now have the Chromium X. It's slightly larger. It enables exactly the same assays that you see here, these four core assays that we have, just provides a little bit more flexibility around the number of cells uh, you can run. Into the instrument, uh, you feed these disposable microfluidic chips that you see there um, next to the instrument. And onto these chips, you load uh, you know, one of these four uh, key assay types that we've listed here. But regardless of your target analyte, the key output from, from all of these essays that we have um, is, the ability to is uh, the ability to characterize heterogeneity. I do also want to highlight that what you see here on the right, the workflow um, actually comes ready to use. It's very robust. And we have uh, for you know, all of these essays and for the majority of input types, uh, demonstrator protocols are very uh, available. And most importantly, I think for most of you is the turnkey uh, software tools that we also provide. So if you're new you know, to the world of single cell and if you wanna apply your research, but feel a little bit intimidated uh, about where to begin, uh, we have solutions for you across the entire workflow and um, we have support here on, on the ground um, by our team from 10X and Millennium Science. So now uh, looking into the actual immune profiling kit, as I mentioned, the core of this essay is uh, the, de the detection of mRNA, where we are capturing whole transcriptome five prime digital gene expression from single cells. However, um, because we are capturing the five prime end of the transcripts, you can also expand the menu of analytes to include full length uh, paired VDJ sequences from T and B cells, meaning you can also examine T and B cell repertoire diversity. And the way this works is that you perform a PCR enrichment step uh, from, CDNA from CDNA molecules that were captured from the single cells to pull out that specific VDJ, specific VDJ sequences. And what this means is uh, that there is no computational, um, you know, a computational analysis needed to do the pairing of the alpha and beta, beta chains uh, if looking at T cells or heavy and light chains if looking at B cells, because you're detecting exactly what the cell is making. Uh, so the pairing information that we analyze comes from the cell itself. Now, that's not the only thing you can achieve with the immune profiling kit. Uh, you can also detect cell surface proteins in addition to the transcriptome Y gene expression and cell surface receptors all from the exact same cell. This is achieved by having DNA barcoded antibodies which bind the cell surface protein. So you can think of the antibody labeling of proteins as being akin to facts, but of course in facts you use a floor for barcoded antibody. And unlike uh, facts and our approach are not limited by spectral overlap of dyes, which means that the number of cell surface proteins you can detect um, or multiplex is essentially unlimited. Uh, and however, of course, you know, there are some practical limitations to using that many antibodies, uh, but what we do see commercially available uh, that there is uh, panels available of, you know, up to or exceeding 100 antibodies uh, specific for different cell surface proteins, and those are being used uh, routinely. 
Now, um, what's super exciting is also that on top of all the information you capture from the exact same cell is that you can now also layer actually antigen recognition on top of it. So basically you get these four different readouts uh, with the immune profiling kits if you wish. So just like the other feature barcoding assays, this works by applying oligo, oligo barcodes indirectly to your antigen of interest. So that antigen binds the T cell or B cell surface receptor. It remains bound in this oligo that is present can now be picked up by our assay biochemistry and used to infer the molecular identity of the antigen species present. So again, from just this one assay, you can get whole transcriptome digital gene expression full-length paired VDJ sequences from T-cell and B-cell receptors. You can capture cell surface proteins as well as antigen recognition for all from the same cell. So in a nutshell, that's the five prime kit. Uh, I wanted to put this slide up here and use this um, opportunity today to just quickly highlight a, couple, a few new products that we've recently uh, launched or announced in, in the case of Beam that might be relevant for you. Um, one is the five prime CRISPR um, assay, which allows you now to measure perturbation effects with multiomic readouts in the, in the five prime assay background. Um, and and the, I think the most important thing about this assay is that you can now rapidly deploy existing Cas9 RNA libraries. You do not have to design specific uh, 10x libraries, not needing to incorporate these capture sequences one or two. The next uh, kit that's really exciting is our fixed RNA profiling kit. Now it's standalone from the five prime immune profiling kit. Uh, here, the exciting thing is that you can fix your cells and tissue at time of collection and store those samples until you're ready to run them. You can do that up to you know six months. And another uh, cool feature of this kit is also that it's inbuilt um, has an inbuilt multiplexing capacity uh, within this probe set that we are using. So you can actually combine up to 16 samples per lane and can you know, drastically reduce costs this way. And then lastly, quickly mentioning again, our BMAP and BMT a product to uh, really conduct comprehensive surveillance of the adaptive immune system, basically high throughput mapping of antigens to receptors at single cell resolution. Um, at this point, it's not launched yet. It's uh, getting uh, launched at the end of the year. So for that one, please uh, stay tuned. We'll pass out um, more information as it becomes available. So overall, the multiomic single cell analysis, you know, allows a large uh, number of um, experiments. It applies to a lot of uh, research areas within the immunology field. And uh, if you're interested in getting started with the 10x uh, single cell experiment, I wanted to point out that we have a number of, of experts on the ground um, in Australia to help you with experimental design applications, workflows, training, etc. Um, so if you are interested, please um, use the QR code or contact us directly um, to set up a meeting. And with that, thank you very much. And I hand over to Nadia. Thanks, Simone. I'll start sharing my screen. Right, thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'm really excited to share with you some of the work I've been doing in developing alternative models to study human macrophage biology and how I started to use single cell technology to not only evaluate our models at a higher resolution, but to also look at how populations respond to an activation signal. And although a lot of my results today will probably be a bit of a teaser, I, I really want to emphasize up front how exciting single cell technology is to not only look at how immune cells respond to an infection, but also how increasingly important this technology is and will be in development of vaccines and therapeutics that aim to shape uh, immune cell populations. So where I wanna to start today is first by talking about macrophages. And I really wanna emphasize how important these cells are to, to study. And this is particularly because they play such an important role in initiation and resolution of inflammation, but they've also play a diverse range of roles in the body from organogenesis to tissue homeostasis. But one of the fantastic qualities about these cells is something that's captured my own heart is that they have this capacity to remember a pathogen they've previously encountered. 
as such it comes across under this umbrella of memory. And you can model this by looking at their enhanced or hyper responsiveness to a pathogen they encounter once again. But to further add to the excitement of the cell type um, is that they have a very interesting developmental background and this further adds to the excitement of studying them. So prior to birth, macrophages are actually seeded in your tissues and will arise from a non-monocytic progenitor. Whereas during adulthood, monocytes in circulation can also give rise to macrophages, particularly during an inflammatory scenario by which monocytes are recruited to the site to assist in responding to infection. So here is a scenario where you have both pre-seeded resident cells in the tissue and a recruited population, both of which are fighting against this infection. What's really fascinating to me is that distinct molecular phenotypes have been described for resident uh, macrophages and the recruited macrophages, but the phenotypic differences between these subsets in response to a bacterial infection or during tissue repair is actually less well understood. So this has actually led me to question a lot of the concept of whether these two populations have predefined roles, such as this um, role assignment context, or whether they have this intrinsically heterogeneity or intrinsic heterogeneity where distinct roles are actually split randomly across your populations, such as being termed quorum sensing here below. But when we start thinking about how can we model this scenario, this recruitment versus residency, I think the first place we need to start is first questioning how we're currently modeling macrophage biology at the moment. So the models that we've been using to study human macrophage biology and perhaps immunology in general has really relied on the use of animal models, um, immortalized cell lines, and even peripheral blood. Now, though they've been all extremely useful for what we now understand of immunology, they do have their own limitations, such as the animal models having fundamental differences in immune function. We have immortalized cell lines that are not physiologically relevant. And although peripheral blood isolated monocytes are extremely useful for studying that recruitment aspect, they still have their own limitations in regards to the lifespan, their source, and also that developmental aspect where we want to model that preceding tissue residency as well. So this takes me to human pluripotent stem cells and how exciting they are, um, because they give us this unique opportunity to start developing these alternative human relevant models. And these are cells that are um, self-renewal and they can give rise to all cells of tissues of the body. So this gives us an opportunity to have a continuous source of cells and a feasibility to do some genome editing as well. So we can start looking at the roles of different genes in the function of cells or even to dissect stages of their development. So you'll see pluripotent stem cells um, coming from embryonic sources or even from uh, reprogrammed adult somatic cells. So these are termed induced pluripotent stem cells. When we start thinking about making macrophages from pluripotent stem cells, there are a large range of number of methods that are now describing this process. And this is a schematic of an overview of how I currently do this in the lab myself. And this is just the process essentially involves um, adding various proteins or instructions to your stem cells to really encourage that lineage development to ultimately give rise to your myeloid progenitors, which you can collect and further differentiate into macrophage-like cells in the presence of MCSF or CSF1 for a few days. So the benchmarking and strategies of these cells have ultimately relied on firstly morphology, which you see here in a schematic, where, sorry, not schematic, this image of taken in the in vitro culture, where you have this beautiful morphology of your macrophages that you can see. You can also look at surface marker expression, where you can see the below image of this flow cytometry run I've done, where we're looking at, in comparison with peripheral blood monocyte macrophages, the iPSC macrophages have very similar surface marker expression, although perhaps lower, a, lo, a very low expression of MHC, which may be due to their um, development in a sterile environment. We can do a large range of functional assays to determine how they respond to um, activation, or even how they engulf or take up um, bees that have this uh, fluorescent capacity in an acidic compartment in the cell. And you can see that in this video here, where these uh, stem cell macrophages are taking up the beads and culture and have these acidic compartments start fluorescing when they start to break them down. But one of the questions that has been so important to me is, can we rely on these very basic uh, benchmarking techniques to say, yes, I have a cell that I wanna make, but how do, we, how do we challenge that? How do we know when we have made a cell that we wanna make? And this brings me to just touch upon the, the myeloid atlas that we've developed which has literally brought 
put together a lot of samples and data sets to explore how stem cell macrophages are comparing to these tissue resident populations. And there have been many studies that have demonstrated that iPSC macrophages share ontogenic pathways with tissue resident populations as a group of cells. With this model atlas, uh, which is available on the Stemplomatics platform for you to explore, we've, sh we've shown how um, these iPSC macrophages compare to tissue resident cells isolated from the body, and observed how these cells actually share the transcriptional programs with these populations as well. But what's exciting as well about this model atlas is that you can project your samples onto this atlas to benchmark your cells in comparison to all these different cell types within it. And this is not only in the context of your bulk sequencing samples, but you can also do this with your single cell um, samples as well. So now I start talking about single cell um, and coming to the point of single cell technology and how I started to use this to address some of the questions I really want to answer. And I think the single cell technology is really providing me with a better resolution to explore population responses and these models as well. But the questions I pose here are that, can we build a model study of these different human macrophage populations that I have uh, first introduced to you a few slides before, where we had that recruited and that resident population? Uh, can we use that single cell technology to explore responsiveness across these models? And can we investigate whether an activation signal such as LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide, a component of gram-negative bacteria, uh, can activate and drive heterogeneous responses within these populations as well? So this comes to my point on my study design, which I use the single cell uh, sequencing to do. And what this, um, to attempt to address those questions, I decided to carry out this single cell experiment of two models that are reflective of the resident population being the stem cell macrophages and a recruited population being the peripheral blood monocyte derived macrophages. So using a pooled experimental design, the cells were cultured in similar conditions and they follow the same stimulation series, which consisted of stimulation with LPS, again, that component of gram-negative bacteria. So the activation series consisted of an initial acute stimulation of two hours, a longer exposure time of 18 hours, and a re-stimulation process, which is gonna enable us to analyze um, endotoxin tolerance response to this ligand or memory. So after the stimulation, these cells were collected and barcoded for demultiplexing after sequencing. And going to the next slide, we're overviewing this, the, the steps that are described in the protocol, Again, the stimulation actually assay, sorry, the collection, the sample preparation, that generation barcoding. We follow the various steps of cDNA amplification in the QCs, that library construction, and setting up sequencing. And once we received our sequencing results, I processed this through the cell ranger pipeline, which ultimately out gave me these output uh, files, barcode features, and matrix, which I used for further analysis using the Surat package. What I'm showing you here on the right is this beautiful UMAP, and this is showing the output of this experiment where you can see that there are stem cell macrophages, in turn PSCMs, and your blood macrophages, MDMs, and you can see how they just cluster separately to each other regardless of the stimulation status. So with these differences and their clustering separately, they both still demonstrate this capacity to respond to stimulation, shown here by an example given to you here on the left, which is showing high expression of TNF, which is classic inflammatory gene. And with this induced expression, we also observed that both models lowered their expression after longer exposure or re-stimulation. This is consistent with what would be expected of an endotoxin tolerance response. And I'm really excited by this because to my knowledge, this hasn't even been looked at in the stem cell macrophages before. So this is the first time we've really demonstrated that this model is really useful to explore that memory aspect in macrophages. And with this, you know, we demonstrate that they can be tolerized uh, to, to TNF. And also in turn, that both recruited and resident cells share majority of the genes of this response. So both models appear to contribute to the inflammation shown by this shared expression of number of upregulated genes here on the right. And these consisted of mainly inflammatory mediators. But what's actually even more exciting to me was that quite a few genes actually escape tolerance in our resident model, our stem cell macrophages. So firstly, both populations showed heterogeneity in the degree of induction of gene expression, or even in the proportion of cells capable of expression of an inflammatory mediator. And that was actually really, really exciting because that shows a heterogeneity in response to an activation signal and that tolerance is not um, a consistent program across both models. 
but also that there was high expression of key cytokines and chemokines, particularly in our stem cell macrophages. And this to me is consistent with a role for tissue resident cells in the recruitment of leukocytes in late stages of infection. And what I'll tease you with is that the majority of core inflammatory mediators were expressed regardless. So what was exciting, I wanted to explore this heterogeneity a little bit more, was that the most obvious driver of this um, high um, differences or increased heterogeneity in expression of these genes was that there seemed to be a high proliferation in our resident cells, but low proliferation in our MDMs. So what I'm showing you here in the slide is that in our activated stem cell macrophages, um, and this existed in our control as well, that there were high levels of um, expression of genes associated with proliferation. So essentially within this model system, we have 50% of our stem cell macrophages that maintain proliferation, and only about 10% of monocyte-derived macrophages or blood macrophages uh, that seem to do this as well. And LPS activation actually did not change its proportion. What was really interesting though, and again, I'm gonna probably tease you, is that the core inflammatory mediators being expressed regardless of their rating status. And these seem to be predominantly targets of post-transcriptional regulation, which we think might be a mechanism that seems to support acute activation in the macrophage that is also dividing. So essentially what we are uh, well, teasing with today is that what we're seeing is that proliferation is driving a quorum sensing in the population. And the differences we're seeing within these different models and this recruitment residency seems to be explained by modified quorum sensing model. So what we're posing here is that the cells um, that are dividing are perhaps not being tolerized and may be encouraging that heterogeneity that we're seeing. So with that, I'll stop there and thank, uh, thank you all for listening and thank all those that are currently involved in the single cell work. And particularly thank you to the 10X Genomics Millennium Science Start Single Cell Fellowship, particularly to Catherine King at 10X and Paul Gooding at Millennium Science that have been so fantastic throughout the process. And thank you both for all your support. And thank you all for listening today. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box or you can raise your hand and you can unmute. Please also take a few moments to complete the poll that's popped up on your screen. So, so Nadia, this is uh, yeah, really great data. Thanks for presenting uh, today. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, with the um, experimental design and the data you have already, what, what are sort of your next steps? Are you considering, I don't know, maybe using an antibody panel and uh, studying this further? Uh, so many options we can go on uh, so many scenarios as well we, we're still doing even more analysis with the data because it's so data rich right when you get back that single cell analysis um so we're actually exploring aspects of uh, donor variation or impacts of donor and how they compare to each other um we're also looking at how we can further model this in the lab and looking at ways we can perhaps even um antibody capturing and looking at protein surface expression and taking that to that protein level would be really exciting so at the moment, of course, we're just looking at the RNA level, right? So we can hypothesize quite a lot of what's happening. But I would love to go back in and re-explore that at a protein level, and that'd be really exciting. Yeah. Any other questions? So it looks like we don't have any uh, further questions, so we might wrap up. Um, thank you again, Nadia, for presenting. Um, we will be sending out the recording of today's um, session to all of the registrants. So if you have any questions that you think of for Nadia, feel free to reach out as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye.